Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Robinson Run. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. On this series, we are examining a micro-history of a single frontier community in western Pennsylvania during the 1770s, 1780s, and 1790s, really through some of the most important events in American history, and we're trying to see what we can learn about early America through the experience of just one small community of people. That community of people is, of course, as the show is called, Robinson Run. Uh, now, on the map in front of us, we have an image of modern western Pennsylvania. And you can see Allegheny County labeled there in the center with a white star for Pittsburgh. And you can see a red star directly beside it. And that is the approximate location of Robinson Run. Uh, beneath it, you can see Washington County and the white star there is the county seat, Washington, as well. Believe it or not, um, really until 1781, Washington County, Pennsylvania, did not exist. The area of Robinson Run um, was adjusted based on how we understand the modern borders. So what I'm saying is in 1781, Washington County, Pennsylvania is created, but the borders are not the same. Um, Robinson Run, even though today it's really in almost the center west of Allegheny County, was in Washington County. So the people that live there, especially the people we've met and we've been introduced to, Gabriel Walker, Isaac Walker, James Ewing, in the future we're going to meet Joseph Scott. Um, they are technically living in Washington County at the time. So what I'm trying to say is the modern borders and boundaries do not apply, but Robinson Run is a creek is still there, uh, Pittsburgh's still there, and of course Washington is still there too. Um, now, most of these men, as we've mentioned, will move to Robinson Run from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, Octorora Township, in the 1770s. But, you know, circumstances change pretty drastically in America in about 1775, because the American Revolution begins. And I know we like to think of the American Revolution uh, as us versus them, big American armies versus big British armies. But the reality is here in the West, it was much more akin to a civil war than it was uh, an imperial struggle. Uh, brutal, hand-to-hand, knife-to-knife combat between communities. Uh, and that includes, yes, settler communities and Native American communities. So when we look at how the revolution would affect the average people here in the West, that's where I do a lot of my own research. Um, these are the kind of things that, that I look at, and this is what I hope to find here at Robinson Run. How do their lives change from the revolution? And I can tell you already, it's going to be pretty drastic. So what you're looking at here uh, is a very classic example of what revolutionary service looks like here in a community like Robinson Run. Um, for the most part here in the West, and I know we don't think of Western Pennsylvania as the West, you know, like Utah or Nevada, but we were the first West. Um, here in the West, that is West of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, a lot of service was far more personal than it was um, arranged in, in, in your typical military experience. These men aren't fighting in armies here in the West, um, but instead they're filling a vital role that we call uh, the role of a ranger. So the man you see on screen here is very typical of an 18th century ranger. Uh, so, you know, what does that person look like? Well, a ranger uh, is a lot like a volunteer fireman by today's standards. He might be a farmer. He might be a blacksmith. He might be a teacher. When time comes, though, you pick up your musket or your hunting rifle and you fight. Um, you don't really have a uniform necessarily. You might have some semblance of a uniform, or you might have what you're wearing at the time. And you're probably not going to encounter, you know, an enormous army anywhere. In fact, you almost never will. Uh, a ranger's job is to patrol the frontier for uh, hostile Native American raiders. Um, Native American attacks often came in the form of ambushes, suddenly and out of nowhere. It's part of what made them so unsettling was... 
you never knew when was when one was right around the corner. Um, so you have the tools you can rely on. You know, you have your hunting rifle because you know how to shoot it. You know how to load it. You know, each gun is its own kind of individual. They have their own little eccentricities. You know all the little tricks. You trust that weapon with your life to eat. So you trust that weapon with your life to fight. Um, you do arrange yourself into what we think of as uh, companies, battalions, but this is what we call militia service. Um, it's not regular army service. So some of the things men in the West would do in their services, again, they would patrol areas where the normal army couldn't reach. For example, in the American Revolution, the Western headquarters of the Continental Army was Fort Pitt uh, in P downtown Pittsburgh. Um, that was the, the base of operations for the whole Continental Army here in the West. And they could patrol the areas around the city pretty well. They couldn't patrol the creeks and the valleys and the back country at all. Um, and that's where they were in regular communication with these ranger units or these militia units. So that's kind of the world that men like our Robinson Run crew fit into. Um, they are here on their own. They don't necessarily um, uh, care much for outside influence over their lives. They protect and defend their own too. So that's the kind of experience of the ranger. Um, here's a good example of a typical ranger experience. All of these men are farmers. So whether there's a war or not in places like Philadelphia and Boston, they have to plant, they have to tend their crops, and they have to harvest. Uh, so one of the things the rangers would do here, and this is pretty common here in the West, is they would take turns working their farms. So um, some of the men would go into the fields and they would turn soil, plant seeds, and harvest. The rest of the men would stand guard around that farm, armed and ready for an ambush or an attack by native warriors, British allied native warriors. And when your farm is done, you then go to your neighbor's farm, and now it's your turn to be on guard duty, and it's your neighbor's turn to tend their crops. So there is a real sense of communalism amongst these Scotch-Irish communities. I think that's really important, and that even kind of trickles into their military service. So I want to give you a sense of when these men served here in Robinson Run in the Revolution, what were they doing? They were not in George Washington's army. They weren't manning a cannon at Bunker Hill. They were patrolling the, the foot trails and the wagon roads and the waterways that, that they knew so well. And they were really good at it. Let's talk now about the organization of the Washington County Militia. And this is going to be a little technical. I won't overwhelm you with it. But I do want to give everyone watching this a sense of how this operates. So Washington County will be formed, as I've mentioned, in 1781. Um, that's right in the middle of the revolution. So almost immediately after the county is formed, we begin to see uh, militia units formed for service. Because these, these units were sort of like a home guard. They were a, a defense at home as well. The Washington County Militia, we're going to get to know them a lot. Remember, Robinson Run is today in Allegheny County. In 1781, the way the borders were drawn, it was in Washington County. Um, they'd have 3,000 men total. So that should give you an idea of about the approximate number of people in Washington County at the time. Um, 3,000 men of fighting age. What was fighting age? Well, we have that on the screen. That's anyone from 18 to 53. So if you think you're ever going to age out or retire out of this kind of service, you are not. If you are an able-bodied man of any age, 53 is pretty old by those standards, you're going to be fighting. And, and, of course, you'd want to because you're defending your family, you're defending your home, you're defending your own people uh, as well. So at all may end men ages 18 to 53, about 3,000 men total. They were organized in 1781 into five battalions, okay, five battalions, stay with me, and each battalion would have eight companies. So five battalions, each with eight companies, you're looking at about, about 40 companies total. And that's how it begins, okay, that's not going to be the rule throughout the war. That's like in a perfect world when they drew this up, um, what it looks like. Um, that's going to change and shift. The battalion leaders and names will change and shift. You know, as the war goes on, things happen. People get killed. 
and they're not replaced. Uh, units get combined together out of necessity. War is really messy. You have to think on your feet. So again, in the beginning, perfect world scenario. 3,000 men, uh, about 40 companies. Five battalions, eight companies each. Any able-bodied man, 18 to 53, has a gun. He's a part of this. Our Robinson run crew is going to fit very neatly into this world. So let's take a look and see where they are. The Washington County uh, Militia, and you can see I have the official records here maintained by the state of Pennsylvania. So all of this I want you to see on the journey, how as historians, how we operate. Um, I wanted to, again, make this real for you. Um, as a professional historian, again, I have certain knowledge of where sources are, and I want I really want to take you into that because a lot of people don't know how we do this. So here we have the official formation date uh, of the Washington County Militia, April of 1781. It will be organized under the command of a man named James Marshall in all of Washington County. He's the head honcho. Beneath him are several what we'll call sub-lieutenants, um, and these are names you're all going to know especially if you live here in western Pennsylvania. Uh, amongst these lieutenants, you have John Cannon, as in Cannonsburg, PA. John Cannon was George Washington's land agent in western Pennsylvania. He was responsible for uh, selling, arranging, finalizing all of George Washington's real estate transactions. You have Daniel Leet, very big you know, uh, name here in this area. If you're familiar with Leetsdale, Leetsdale PA, that's where he's going to be. Um, George Vallandingham. George Vallandingham was a major landowner here in, in Eastern PA. Uh, James Allison, okay, Allison Park, places like that. These are early names you're all going to know. Um, but these are really high-profile people. And for most of our Robinson Run crew, they're just regular average folks. So they're really not ever going to have a, a lot of connection with these people here. But I want to give you a sense of, of how it's all organized. Okay. Our crew, the people we're looking at, uh, are going to be part of the 4th Battalion. And the 4th Battalion is under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John Marshall. So remember, uh, we have uh, about 40 companies, okay? Uh, and we have uh, five battalions. So the Robinson Run Group are in the 4th Battalion. Uh, their company officer is named John Marshall. So far, we've met uh, a few different people. We've met Gabriel Walker and Isaac Walker, and we've met James Ewing. And we're going to meet some more people down the road. It's really cool. I'm excited about it, but I'm still working on it. Um, but we know where they fit into this perfectly. Um, James Ewing um, is going to be uh, under the command of Captain Robert Miller, the 4th Company, 4th Battalion, uh, Gabriel and Isaac Walker, as we'll see, are going to be under the command of Captain Joseph Cisna. Uh, and you can see this is uh, the 5th Company, 4th uh, Battalion, which later, because of reorganization, chaos in the war, it actually becomes a 2nd Battalion. Joseph Cisna will be living closer to what is today Bridgeville, PA, uh, but he moves around a lot. But what I want to show you here is we, we uh, are going to be able to identify exactly where our Robinson Run crew served, and now we know exactly how they served too. Here is a look at Captain Joseph Cisna's uh, company here uh, in the year 1782. Um, and we can see, again, Captain Joseph Cisna there on the screen, Lieutenant John Connor, uh, Ensign Thomas Redman. Why am I showing you this? Well, if you continue down the muster rolls, here you're going to see uh, the classes of his militia. Um, in the, let's get this right, 2nd Battalion now, so it's changed his name, um, we have 2nd Class uh, on the top of the screen. Let me get my little pen out so I can show you this. All right, we're going to be right here. We have Gabriel Walker, second class. So we know Gabriel Walker's farm. We found it. What about his younger brother? Well, he's going to be in that same company, but a different class, seventh class. And this is going to be Isaac Walker. And Guys, this is real technical, but there you go. So there we have uh, Gabriel Walker, 
and Isaac Walker in Joseph Cisna's company. Now you'll notice they're in different classes, second class and seventh class. Why would they do that? Well, they're brothers, remember. So if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, you know there's always military consideration for moving family members out of immediate units. You know, if one of these units, if one of these classes is overrun and destroyed by British allied native warriors, you don't want both brothers to die. You want to give them at least a little bit of space there. So we can see here in this group, both Walker brothers, Gabriel, the older man, uh, now in his late 40s, Isaac Walker, only in his 30s. They are both serving as rangers in the Washington County militia. But all of the people with them, you can see by the names listed, are their friends. They're people they know, they're people they grew up with, and they're all more or less fighting the same war. But it's very cool for us to find how they're going to be serving and what that looks like. What we're going to see next is the muster roll of Captain Robert Miller's company. And you're going to notice this is going to be a different company. Uh, of course, we're going to be looking for uh, the real sort of man that will become the kind of leader of Robinson Run eventually, uh, James Ewing. Remember, Ewing had that fort um, at the end of Robinson Run where people would run and hide in the case of uh, an event or an attack. That's going to happen, by the way. Um, but he's not going to be serving in Cisna's company, even though... Again, his, his plantation is very close to Robert Cisna's home himself and very close to the other people in Robinson Run. He's actually going to serve in Robert Miller's company. Um, and we can fast forward to there again. And there we can see, I'll get out my magic pen, James Ewing. Um, remember when we first met James Ewing? James Ewing was living in what is today Moon Township, Pennsylvania. Uh, so at this point in the revolution, he's a major landowner. He owns land kind of everywhere. Of course, along Robinson Run, he still owns his mill uh, in Moon Township. He owns land in Cecil Township. He's actually going to be serving in the Cecil Township crew here. Um, and again, it's, there's a lot of reasons that go into that. Some are probably personal. Where does he want to go? Where does he want to be? It's hard to say. Uh, but James Ewing is serving. Um, he's not serving with the Robinson Run Group. And that probably has more to do with, again, what land he values, where he lives, and maybe even, think about this, which of these companies needs the most help. But all of these men initially are in the 4th Battalion. Remember, there's 8 battalions. 4th uh, Battalion, excuse me, there's 5 battalions. 4th Battalion, Washington County Militia. Okay. Now, one person we haven't met yet in the show, but we will in a huge way, and I'm so excited for this, uh, is a man named Joseph Scott. We've briefly talked about him and his origins in Octorora Township, Pennsylvania, in that Scots-Irish community outside of Lancaster. Um, we're going to see him in the future. I'm going to sit down at length with... Um, his descendants, they're going to show you all of the things that they have from him. They still live on his land. It's, I can't wait, but it takes time. So please be patient. Um, but Joseph Scott's going to be the next person we key in on along with the walkers, uh, and the Ewings. And he's going to be serving. This is really interesting in the Hopewell township, um, group, uh, the Hopewell township company. Um, he's still in the fourth battalion. So you're kind of king in geographically where this is. Uh, but he's going to be under the command of Captain William Scott's 1st Company. So let's take a look at 1st Company, 4th Battalion. We have, again, uh, Captain William Scott in charge, John Carpenter, his lieutenant, Isaac Smith, his ensign. What we're looking for there in the 5th class of the 1st uh, Company is Joseph Scott, and you see him there. And you'll see he's also serving with Samuel Scott. Remember, the uh, company commander is William Scott. There's a lot of reasons Joseph Scott is not in the Robinson Run group, even though he does live in Robinson Run. Remember, we just haven't met him yet. Don't go back and look. We're going to do a really kind of extensive profile of him. Um, Joseph Scott, as you'll see in the episode coming up, uh, owned a huge amount of property first in uh, Moon Township near what is today um, Outback Steakhouse and the FedEx building. Um, this is going to be sort of off Ewing Road, 
uh, the, the far outskirts of Robinson Township. Um, we'll talk about all that, though. Uh, but he's going to be serving in that group, and I think there's two reasons for it. Number one, geographically, he lives there. But number two, most of his relatives are in this group. Uh, and that's another element of militia service I wanted to touch on. Remember, these Scots-Irish communities are very prolific. Lots of aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, very familiar groups. Um, and they are going to often, you know, allow that to be their moral compass and their guiding compass in a lot of their decisions. So here we have Joseph Scott serving in the uh, 1st Company, 4th Battalion, um, and it's kind of a family affair. All of this will come full circle for us, I promise, in the episodes to come. But we are again keying in on, in this series, the Ewings, the Walkers, and the Scots. So I want to give you an update on where Joseph is, even though we haven't met him yet. My gosh, you won't forget him when you do. Now here's some real high-level history. And um, I want to kind of give you a sense of what this looks like, because this will play into future events. In the fall of 1781, we are going to see the hard realities of the American Revolution hitting western Pennsylvania. The British have secured uh, wartime alliances with a number of powerful native nations, particularly from the Great Lakes. And those Native American warriors are now raiding, ambushing, uh, and destroying communities in western Pennsylvania. They're also doing it in Kentucky. They're also doing it in Illinois. They largely uh, coordinate with the British out of Fort Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and again, that kind of shows you the overall reach that frontier politics have. So by 1781, the community leaders of Robinson Run, uh, Moon Township, Finley Township, um, the larger Washington County world come together and they will send a letter to Brigadier General William Irvine. Irvine uh, is the man who's in overall command of the Western Department. That is to say, the western half of the Continental Army at this time. And I'm going to read you some of this letter because it's re really important. The primary takeaway is, here in Washington County, Indian raids, Native American raids, are taking their toll. Um, the men can't keep up with their defense. They don't have enough weapons. They don't have enough bullets. They don't have enough gunpowder. They don't have enough material support. They sense that the tide is turning against them and they need more help from the United States government, whatever exists of it, to fight off this new threat. They write the letter to Brigadier General Irvine in Fort Pitt, and they want him to forward this to Congress in Philadelphia. And it's this impassioned pleading letter I'd encourage you to look up, begging for support. So let me read some of this to you. Uh, we who have the honor of addressing you are a number of the inhabitants of the Western country who have been from the earliest period of the war attached to the cause of America and amongst whom a full proportion of troops were raised and sent to fight the campaigns against the British foe. Yet living as it were on the ends of the American earth, I love that, they call Robinson Run, they call Western PA the ends of the American earth, we seem to have been to a great degree neglected by brethren beyond the mountains, who have left us exposed to the misdeeds of the savages of the wilderness. Pretty impassioned speech here. Uh, not politically correct anymore, but it's not my job to change these things. It's my job to read them and interpret them. Roused and excited by the same foe who invade from the sea. So again, this is a reference to the British and their newfound uh, alliance with native peoples of the Great Lakes and the larger Ohio frontier. While the war in that quarter continued heavy and difficult to be supported, some relief to us on the frontier might be afforded. We would therefore beg leave to represent to your honor, that's to Irvine, the state of our suffering, our apprehensions of further devastation, and to mention what measures we conceive will be necessary for our defense. Okay. Now, here in the West, again, they are really running low on supplies. They are pleading with Congress to not forget them. They're, they're trying to say, we are a major part of the war effort, too, and we are suffering. And you have to send us troops. You have to send us help, supplies, material, manpower, anything. It's a very long letter. I'm just going to read excerpts. But they are begging for help because they feel like if help doesn't come, 
there's sort of an impending doom that's awaiting them. And as we'll see, that's going to be prophetic. Here we have some more. Uh, we have intelligence by prisoners who have made their escape from the different parts of the Indian country that flush with the success of murder and butchery in our settlements, in which hundreds of families have been cut to pieces, many carried off in the course of the past years, and more especially in the preceding summer, the savages of the northward, westward, and southward are making the most industrious preparations for war and meditate early in the ensuing spring and ever. Okay, so we kind of lose the language there. More extensive blows to our settlements than we have ever felt before. Here's what they're saying. Congress is telling these people, um, the Indians are low on supplies. The native warriors don't have the means to attack you. It's okay. You're low on supplies, so are they. What the Robinson Run community and their neighboring communities are saying is that that is not true. We have people, our people, who have escaped native captivity, who were held hostage in these native communities and escaped. And they're telling us they have tons of supplies. They are packed to the gills with gunpowder and ammunition and scalping knives and tomahawks. They are preparing for some major assault in the spring of 1782. Remember, this writ letter is written in the fall of 1781. Congress is telling them they're safe. They don't trust that. Their own people who have escaped native captivity are telling them the Indians are flush with materials. Okay, We have no reason to distrust the information that they are abundantly supplied with ammunition by the British. Their cabins are represented as full of powder and ball. They are constantly employed, their arms, disposing their ammunition for use in their invasions. And we have boasts of what they will do and in what manner they will inundate us. This is really important. This is the fall of 1781. As we're going to see in the episodes to come, there will be a major Native American offensive, British allied Native American offensive into Western Pennsylvania in 1782. Everyone will be caught off guard by this. At least that's the story. We know here the people in Robinson Run and this northern part of the former Washington County, today Allegheny County, aren't going to be caught off guard at all. They know it's coming. They just don't know exactly when. This is really critical. As a historian, I'm really excited about this. Because again, as I mentioned, they were told these people are part of the overall war effort and a, and a vital part of it. But they're not being supported. They're not being given supplies. And if the larger Continental Congress and George Washington's larger Continental Army keeps ignoring them, they are going to be the ones that suffer. And it's a really helpless situation for them. All right, here's the last part of this letter I want to read to you. I know it's not thrilling television, but I just get really excited about it. On this representation, we have the honor to lay before you. We hope our brethren beyond the mountains will be engaged to give us guidance, and they will come under what it is to see our fellow men, our helpless women and children, every week and hour in their houses, in their fields, lying hacked by the tomahawk, scalped and hurting, their throats cut by the knife of the savages. They will consider what it is to be every moment under apprehensions of this kind of death or of being reduced to the necessity of quitting our habitations and leaving every mean of subsistence behind. We hope they will consider of this and make it a common cause against the miseries we have to contend with. Um, and that's sort of the end of the letter. It doesn't get more passionate and serious than this. These people are telling Easterners, What's going to await them? Think about that language. Helpless women and children lying hacked in the fields, hacked to death by the tomahawk, scalped and hurting, their throats cut by the knife of British allied native warriors. This is shocking to me um, because, again, this is not something that most people have a sense of when it comes to the American Revolution. We think of big armies, redcoats and bluecoats marching on battlefields. We don't think of brutal partisan conflict where women and children are taken captive and murdered but that's the reality of the war in the west that's where i do all of my research so i hope you guys can see why i'm really excited to find a letter like this so this is the fall of 1781 okay the fall of 1781 this is a letter that will be signed by a lot of prominent leaders in washington county and members of the washington county militia 
amongst them, of course, is Gabriel Walker. Um, you will not believe the violent destruction that is about to befall these people. I'll tell you just in advance, in the spring of 1782, Robinson Run, the communities we've been studying, will be completely annihilated uh, by British allied native attacks. And here in 1781, these poor people are pouring their hearts out, uh, begging for support that will never come. So they're going to hold on to this animosity. They're going to be ignored. The support will never come. The Continental Congress never even writes them back. And that's going to fester for the over the next decade. That distrust of the government, that dislike, that feeling of being rejected or ignored, all of this is going to come to a head in the episodes to come. So I'm really excited to share this with you as always. Um, you know, we're, we're making episodes every week, so stay tuned. Uh, as always, if you have questions, comments, if you have helpful anecdotes, family history in this area, please uh, reach out to me. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram. And, uh, of course, you can send me a, you know, a link here on YouTube. Anything you want, BradyKreitzer.com. Find me any way you can. Um, let's build this project together. All right. See you next time.